Oh, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, I was having a little video issue there for a minute, so finally we got it logged in. Um, it's nine fifty nine, so I don't know if you, I should wait a minute or two for folks to log in or. Well, you can if you want. Um, I'm having some technical difficulties on my end, so I might come and go. Um, we're trying to work that out, but we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> But uh, feel free to start whenever you want. Okay, I guess I'll just jump right in then. Um, first, thanks everybody for spending part of your this beautiful Saturday afternoon or morning with us. Um, again, my name is Steve Porter. Over the last probably ten or fifteen years, I've had a number of different roles in publishing. I started out um, as an independent author, as a self-published author. And that's what kind of got me rolling on all this. Um, we published, my wife and I got together. My wife's a designer. Um, I'm somewhat of an editor and a writer. We put our heads together. I wrote my first novel, had some success with it. Put together a second novel, self-published that. But here in Rhode Island, I was disappointed uh, with the response that a lot of our writers get, that our independent authors have. And as I went around to libraries and bookstores and places, I didn't see that enthusiasm that I expected, particularly here in Rhode Island where we have such a strong arts community, you'd think there'd be a real, you know, an incredible amount of enthusiasm for the writers we had. Um, before I was a writer, I was the advertising and public relations director for the old laureates chain. So if you remember laureates, um, I think anybody here from, all, most of you I assume are New England. So, um, you know, we were in Copley and Peabody and Braintree and Burlington and every, probably every big city in the state. Um, so I thought I knew everything there was to know about books until I wrote and published my own. Um, and when I was disappointed with the response we got, I threw five or six authors together in a room one day and said, well, let's let's start our own little nonprofit. Um, I think at that point, I probably was a member of IPNI, uh, but in Rhode Island, we had so many different writers running around. So we, we started the Association of Rhode Island Authors with six of us. And at our peak last year, we had 365 authors. As and I believe if I checked around the country, I couldn't find a larger organization of independent writers and publishers than ARIA. Um, and we went full 501c3. We have uh, done events almost on a weekly basis around the state. And we really became known for our author expo, which we hold each December in um, Cranston, which this year will be virtual just like this. And um, Last year, we had 135 authors with about 12 to 1400 readers who attended. Um, so we feel like we really made a big splash. So where I'm heading with this story is that as we started meeting different authors, uh, we started helping each other out, maybe do a free Kindle book for one author, another author would come and need some artwork. So we'd kind of share. And that evolved into what became Stillwater River Publications which is um, our self-publishing company. Uh, to date, we've published about 300 to 325 different books uh, for authors. We started in Rhode Island and we started around the country. Uh, now we have authors in Germany, New Zealand, um, Japan, China, and South, uh, uh, South Korea. And we seem to be getting bigger, a little bit bigger every day. Three years ago, um, when we were looking for a larger office space, I made the crazy suggestion and said, hey, if we're going to pay rent, we're going to pay taxes, we might as well leave the doors open and call it a bookstore. Because after all, my background with laureates running bookstores to them, um, maybe we could do both. So three years ago in March, we became a independent bookstore. Um, we're full service. We have new releases and bestsellers and all that. We also carry used books. Um, we have a, a large selection, which is I'm in the office and you can probably see the bookstore over my shoulder. Um, 
We have about 12,000 used books in the store, all in excellent condition, you know, bargain prices. Um, and then we open two or three different web portals where we can sell online. So we feel like from the writing to the publishing to the, to the retailing, we've got the whole thing in one package. But today's topic, it's kind of like the three or four minute introduction here, is working with new authors when they come into our bookstore for the first time. There are a lot of misconceptions about what a bookstore really is. Now, I can tell you that every day I get um, an email, a phone call from some author somewhere in the United States. We're members of the ABA, American Bookseller Association. So our email address and contact information goes out to folks um, all over. So I'll get a call from an author or an email, it'll say, hey, hey, I want you to carry my new book. I just published this book. I want you to carry a whole bunch of them in your store. And here's some information about that book. It's doing great on Kindle. It's doing great on Amazon. And maybe you should order some because it's on, you can order, I can order them through KDP or through Ingram Square. You can get books, you can do all the, and they forget what we, what a bookstore really is. So the first thing is not all bookstores are equal. There are many types of bookstores. Here where I'm sitting is an independent bookstore. We are, it is, you know, owned by Dawn and I, this is it. You know, we are, we are the owners. We have a staff of about six people. We are the whole, the whole shooting match. There are also chain bookstores like Barnes and Noble um, where there are multiple locations. There are college bookstores they tend to run under different rules and, and has kind of have a different world with the, with the college stores. We have online stores. Um, we've heard a lot, you may have heard a lot about Bookshop in the last few, few months. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then there are alternative markets, gift shops, gift stores that maybe don't sell books as their primary item, but still sell books somewhere in their, in their location. Not every bookstore is created equal. Now, the reason we all love bookstores is for, for, for the mythos. It, it, it's for the narrative that they talk about when they're talking about using, you know, going to a bookstore. You know, bookstores support the local community. Independent bookstores are so important. Every town wants to have one. They're gathering places. Every bookstore that I can think of is a place for readers to come in, for authors to come in and do readings, for presentations, for book signings. Here in our store, up until COVID, uh, we were trying to do at least one per week. Some weeks we had two or three presentations going on, readings, presentations, workshops, you name it. We, we, we were deeply immersed in, in that stuff. Um, so it became a gathering place. People knew they could come here, the new poet, the new author, the new reader. Um, it, was, it was a really, it, it's part of the, the responsibility of a bookstore, I think, is to, to connect to that community. Uh, we become the literary center of the community. Um, it's where writers meet, where writers write. We are, you know, we try to build our great selection. Bookstores are also have been to be told they're the defenders of the First Amendment. So you see um, presentation and displays in stores about banned books. And, and, you know, this is where if there's a book out there that's being banned or trying to be banned, everybody will want a copy and this is where they'll come for it. So bookstores are providing all these important services to the community. But that doesn't mean when an author walks into a bookstore for the first time with their books, that does not mean that it's a nonprofit. It does not mean that its mission overtakes the fact that first, it's a business. And that what a bookstore has to do to survive, sell books, and contribute to its bottom line. Now, all those things they talked about the mythos are what bookstores tell readers, not what they tell their, their publishers. Publishers and bookstores have a completely different relationship. Now, one important point to remember about the book industry behind the scenes is that it's an extremely contentious industry. It's extremely stressful. Um, it's in court, frequently suing each other. Um, Amazon and Barnes and Noble, when Amazon first came on the scene, Amazon and Barnes and Noble you know, sued each other regularly. Uh, it was a great lawsuit 
that Barnes and Noble um, struck against Amazon many years ago because Amazon was using, when they first launched, they were the world's biggest bookstore or the earth's biggest bookstore. And Barnes and Noble said, no, they're not, we are. And they actually had a lawsuit over the use of that phrase. Amazon ended up dropping it, but they did win the suit. Um, if you follow bookstores online, you know that independent bookstores are always at odds with Amazon. So we've, we've seen this big promotion just recent with the ABA where they're calling it, you know, box out Amazon. And you might even see some of it online where there's stacks of boxes in front of independent bookstores telling them, you know, box out Amazon, shop independent. Um, so independent bookstores don't like Amazon. Independent bookstores also are at war with Barnes and Noble because that's, you know, a communities, most communities in the United States, unfortunately, can only handle one bookstore, if any. And when there's a Barnes and Noble next door, it makes it extremely difficult for an independent bookstore to survive. Back in the 90s, when Amazon, or excuse me, Barnes and Noble started to pop up their stores all over the place, Borders started to pop up stores. It killed the independent bookstores. Um, you saw them start going out, out of business in droves because consumers preferred shopping in the big box stores. And that's true to a point today. People still go to Home Depot and Lowe's um, and Circuit, Circuit City went out, but stores like that, um, Best Buy even still survives today. There have been lawsuits between Apple and publishing over in the publishing community over price fixing. Um, the publishers and Amazon get together and collude on price fixing as well. Um, and then of course, there's the battle between what's better, the paper book or the ebook. So you have battles that go on behind the scenes. And you, you, so if you read Publishers Weekly, if you read the media, if you're, if, you're, if you're watching the industry, you see these contentious things happening all the time. Um, it's a very stressful, very professional, very business-like industry. And the problem authors have is as an author, you know your, what you write about. You're an expert in what you write about. You publish that book. You're an expert in what you've done. Then you're walking into an industry that you have no idea how it works. Bookstores make money three ways. The first is what, what, what retailers call margin. And that's that difference between um, what a book costs and what the consumer pays for it. The second way that they make money is through, what's, through book returns. What many authors don't realize is that most books that are ordered at a Barnes and Noble or at an independent store are returnable. And what that means is I can go out right now and order a whole bunch of the big, um, the big book this fall is going to be the Barack Obama memoir. Um, it's, it's a massive thing. It's going, it's like 700 pages and it's going to be 45 bucks if you want to buy one. And, um, when that book comes out, I've got to make a significant financial investment in stocking plenty of copies for my store. Now, what happens if it doesn't sell? I've now spent hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on piles of these books that I'm stuck with. So publishers allow me to return those books for credit. I can then take that credit and buy whatever the new big book is going to be in January. That keeps this whole books industry almost as a consignment industry. And it allows me to continue to roll that, that, those returns and that credit so that I'm never stuck with lots and lots and lots and lots of books. So returns are a big, big part of how bookstores are able to survive. Now, the third thing to remember about how bookstores make their money is what's called inventory turn. Hey, I've got books in my store. Right now, my, the store behind me has 12,000 different titles. Let's say, just to pick some round numbers, let's just say off the top of my head that I sell, we'll take a, a, a fantasy bookstore and say they sell $500,000 worth of books a year. Well, if their inventory is worth $500,000, that means they turned their store once. That's a one turn. $500,000 with sales, $500,000 in inventory. So statistically speaking, 
If you, the author, give my bookstore one copy of your book and I sell that one copy during the year, you're equal to my inventory turn. That's a successful thing. And I can't tell you how many books authors will come in and they'll see where they gave me three, four, five copies of their book and we sold a couple and they're disappointed. Because there's this thing, feeling that, well, maybe we're selling just thousands and thousands and thousands of books and here we are only selling one or two from the independent author. So inventory turn is, is important to bookstores. Now, getting back to margin a little bit that difference between what the consumer pays and what the book is valued at. Um, when you go into a Barnes and Noble or you go into any independent store, you walk around, you see different books, you'll see what's usually what's up front. Remainder companies, books that are left over, promotional books. Bookstores get 50 to 80% off the retail on those. Toys and gifts and cards is usually about 50 to 60%. Books for major publishers, about 45%. Wholesalers, like Ingram, about 40%. And then magazines, if any stores carry magazines anymore, I think I'm one of the last few that even bothers, um, is only 20%. So that tells you in the bookstore's mind, what's the most important thing for them to sell? They'll make more money if they sell toys, gifts, cards, older books, because that's where the margin is. That's where they make more to their bottom line. They actually make more money to their bottom line selling that stuff than they do new books. Now, one other way that a lot of ind independent authors work with bookstores is on consignment. Consignment means that you're going to bring your books to us and we're not going to pay for them. We're only going to pay you for them when those books sell. If that's the case, the bookstore is very happy because it can take your books in without any um, risk and then you can make sales on them. That possibility opens up the opportunities for a lot of different independent authors. Um, a lot of authors don't wanna hear that. They want the bookstore just to order their books from Ingram or whatever wholesaler they want, or may perhaps directly from their publisher, if you're lucky enough to have a small press. But it's important that bookstores provide that opportunity. Now, when you walk into a Barnes and Noble, there's another important thing about how bookstores work. You walk into a big bookstore, you'll see all these books on end caps. You'll see all these books on tables up front, stacked very neatly and nicely. You'll see end caps and displays all over the place of new books and new snacks. Well, understand that most, a lot of those books are in those positions through programs with that bookstores have with publishers. So when they sit down and decide how the store is laid out, it's not a guess, it's pre-planned through what's called co-op programs. Publishers are paying the bookstore to display those books in those specific locations. And they do it through what they call co-op where if let's say it's a random house book, you know, I mentioned the new Barack Obama book coming out. That's such a big investment for the publishers. I think that's coming through Simon and Schuster. Um, that they want to make sure that book is front, front of store in every bookstore in the country. So they give me a credit. They give the bookstore a credit that they can use to advertise that book later. So the bookstore makes out not only by selling the book, but also by placing it up front in these programs, these advertising co-op programs. So now here you come, the independent author, and you're walking into the store and you think, boy, you've got the best book ever. And you, you, know, you want your book right up front on that front table at, at the bookstore, just like everybody, every other publisher. Well, there's a reason why they're not going to do that. And part of that is, is a trying to understand it. Um, and I don't wanna make it sound like I'm being negative to bookstores at all. To me, I've always looked at this as it's, it's like playing a game when you don't know the rules. The bookstores know the rules. The bookstores have been following these rules for decades. 
publishers know the rules because they have been too. But with a small press or an independent author and you walk into a bookstore for the first time, how do you know, how are you supposed to know all these things? So co-op is certainly a way you know, that, in, that bookstores can benefit. So the question is, let's say you've written a, a book that's you know, a great new Italian cookbook. You've written a children's book. Uh, we've just published one ourselves on uh, COVID. It's about a little book about superheroes. It's where, you know, if you, you know, for, it's for little kids to tell them wear your mask and you too can be a superhero and save the world. Um, you know, it's really adorable little book. It comes with a free little mask. So it sounds like if you're a bookstore, that would be a great book to have right now. Very timely, very, you know, very important, uh, very cute, very nicely illustrated. It's a cute little children's book to carry. The problem with that is that Random House has done almost the same book. And it stars Sesame Street characters. So if I'm an independent bookstore, or Barnes and Noble, and I have to make the decision to carry, because I've only got limited shelf space. You know, there are 6 million books out there, 10 million books out there to choose from. I can only choose one on this topic. Do I choose the one with Elmo wearing the mask, or do I choose the one from the author no one's ever heard of? The one with Elmo, they might even give me co-op have me place it to the front of the store and allow me to return it anytime I want to. Whereas the independent author can't do those things. So as a bookstore, which one should I choose? And that's why oftentimes indie authors have so much trouble getting their books into stores because they're displacing another book that might sell better. Now, if you're walking, going you know, shopping and you walk into a bookstore today, which of those two books might you want to buy if you've got a child that you want to buy a book for? Um, the one with Elmo that you've heard about, that's the, the kid you know he's going to like the Sesame Street characters, or by the author that you're not really sure about, haven't heard of yet. And so the bookstore knows which one is going to sell better. So that's one of the obstacles, for lack of a better word, that the independent author is up against. I also want to talk about consignment a little bit more too. Most bookstores can order your book. One of the big mistakes that authors make when they go to a bookstore is they tell them they can or that it they'll tell them to order it through Ingram, and they'll discover that Ingram has the book listed as a vendor of KDP and as a discount of 20% non-returnable. So as I explained a few minutes ago, bookstores make their money and they stay in business because they can return books. And if your book isn't returnable, they're not going to be able to order it from Ingram. Second problem is if your book is ordered through Amazon, independent bookstores and Barnes and Nobles, you know, one of the, one of the dirty words when you walk into them is Amazon. So if you're publishing through KDP, the store may not want to carry it just for that fact. So your choices on publishing through Ingram Spark or KDP or maybe another source, um, bookstores do take a negative view of KDP books for that reason. They are the competitor. They don't want to enrich their own competitor for, for, based on your book. So a lot of bookstores allow for consignments. You can walk your book in the store, they'll carry a few copies, KDP or not. You can put them on the shelf. If it sells, you get a check. If it doesn't sell, um, you just go pick the books up someday and take them home. One thing to look out for is a lot of stores, some stores, not all stores, have consignment agreements and they'll give you the consignment agreement. The standard consignment agreement is 60-40, which means you're going to keep 60% of the value 